Why did King Herod try to kill the baby Jesus? In the Gospel of Matthew, a group of magi from the east visit King Herod in response to an astrological sign that said a new king had been born. Herod, fearing this child might challenge his claim to the throne, ordered the massacre of all children under two within the vicinity of Bethlehem, which forced Mary and Joseph to take Jesus into hiding in Egypt. There is debate over whether this event actually happened, but King Herod's reign was known for its vicious brutality and suppressing challenges to his authority, especially when those challenges were framed in messianic terms, as the life of Jesus is. So even if the event didn't actually happen, it is emblematic of the Roman era Jews' perception of their last king with any amount of independence. But the massacre of innocents happened towards the end of Herod's reign. So in order to fully understand the last gasp of Jewish autonomy until the 20th century, we need to go back several decades. In 63 BCE, Judea was once again in the throes of civil war. The high priest, Hyrcanus II, was challenged by his brother, Aristobulus II, for control of the kingdom. The Romans would intervene in the conflict, forcing both Hyrcanus and Aristobulus to meet with Pompey in Damascus to plead their cases. Pompey awarded the rulership to Hyrcanus and took Aristobulus and his family as hostages back to Rome. The Romans would also leave a trusted ally to serve as procurator under Hyrcanus II, Antipater. Antipater had fought with Pompey in Egypt and was seen as a valuable asset in Jerusalem. He was the son of Antipas, an Edomite who had converted to Judaism and had been appointed by Hyrcanus II as governor of Edomia. Due to their status as converts, they had to overcome issues of distrust among the populace, and their support for Hellenism didn't help. Not everyone took the loss of sovereignty lying down. Aristobulus and his sons would launch several rebellions against the Romans and Hasmoneans. The first came from his eldest son, Alexander, who escaped while being taken to Rome. He returned to Judea and was able to stir up a rebellion in the countryside. Hyrcanus II had no military of his own to command, so he was dependent on General Gabinius, the Roman proconsul of Syria, to put down the revolt, who managed to do so and send Alexander back to Rome. To prevent future rebellions, Gabinius had the walls around cities and fortresses torn down and took away what little political power had been left with the high priest, and divided Judea into five districts and appointed his own rulers for them to sow further disunity among the Jews. This was followed by another revolt, led by Aristobulus II and his son Antigonus. They faced a disastrous loss to the Romans and were forced to flee across the Jordan River, entrenching themselves in the fortress of Macareus. Aristobulus would eventually be captured and brought back to Rome, but surprisingly, his family were allowed to return to Judea. Alexander would attempt another revolt while the Romans were on an expedition in Egypt, but he would be defeated at a battle near Mount Tabor. Back in Rome, the first triumvirate of Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus had taken power and carved up the empire into spheres of influence, giving control over the eastern Mediterranean to Crassus. He wanted to invade the neighboring Parthian Empire, but his war chest was insufficient, so he would raid the temple treasury in Jerusalem to finance his expedition. He would die in battle against the Parthians in 53 BCE, who retaliated by invading Roman Syria. Crassus would be succeeded by Cassius, who had to defend Syria from the Parthian armies. But Crassus raiding the temple had sparked a rebellion, led by Pithilaus, a lieutenant from Jerusalem. Cassius managed to put down the revolt at the Battle of Tarachia in 52 BCE. Pithilaus would be put to death, and 30,000 participants were sold into slavery. Civil war would break out in Rome in 49 BCE, with Pompey and the Senate fleeing across the Ionian Sea, leaving Julius Caesar in control of the capital. Cassius, Hyrcanus II, and Antipater were known allies of Pompey. So in order to win control of the Eastern Mediterranean, Caesar pulls Aristobulus out of captivity and gives him two legions to go conquer Judea, and promises to place him back on the throne. But before Aristobulus could reach Judea, two of Pompey's supporters would poison him and behead his son Alexander. After Pompey was killed in Egypt, Antipater switched sides to support Caesar, and helped Cleopatra recruit an army, which included Jewish divisions. He was also able to secure the support of the Jewish community of Alexandria for Cleopatra. As thanks for their support, Caesar abolished the reforms of Gabinius and reunited administerial control of Judea under Jerusalem and allowed them to rebuild walls around their cities and fortresses. He also restored the political authority of the high priest and made the office hereditary. He also rewarded Antipater and his family with Roman citizenship. The Jews were once again given autonomy over their internal affairs and were given exemption from serving in the Roman military as well as giving tribute. 
Antipater would use this new autonomy to secure his family's power in Judea. He made his eldest son, Phazel, the governor of Jerusalem, while his second son, Herod, was made governor of the Galilee. Living in the time of King Herod had to have been so chaotic. I mean, could you imagine? Poisonings, beheadings, civil wars. It might be controversial, but it's a historian's job to see similarities between their time and ours. Violent transitions of power, ongoing wars, and a huge wealth gap between the ruling class and everyday citizens? Which leads me to an important question. What can we do to narrow that gap a bit? In order to avoid the uh, figurative chopping of heads, we'd need new solutions, new strategies, new ways in order to preserve our wealth so our children can flourish. Because last year, everyday people racked up record-setting amounts of debt, losing millions that would have gone towards their retirement. However, in the same time period, today's sponsor, Masterworks, paid out tens of millions in total to people like you by giving them access to one of the oldest investments in the world, fine art. So far, Masterworks has sold 11 paintings from artists like Monet and Warhol, each for a positive net return. Even through COVID, economic meltdowns, and rising inflation, over 630,000 people have signed up already, and offerings have sold out within minutes. But you guys, my subscribers, can skip the waitlist by clicking the link down in the description below, because history doesn't have to repeat itself. But with all that out of the way, let's get back to the action. Who is Herod going to behead next? Net return refers to the annualized internal rate of return net of all fees and costs, calculated from the offering closing date to the date of the sale is consummated. IRR may not be indicative of Masterworks paintings not yet sold in past performance is not indicative of future results. See important regulation A disclosures, masterworks.com slash CD. Herod was successful as governor, managing to put an end to a band of robbers terrorizing the countryside. However, Herod made enemies with the Sanhedrin by putting their leader to death, which was a power the Sanhedrin claimed sole right to. They lobbied Hyrcanus to put Herod on trial, which he eventually agreed to. Herod tried to intimidate the Sanhedrin with an armed retinue, but the Pharisees aroused the court to its duty. The Sanhedrin were going to punish Herod, but the new proconsul of Syria, Sextus Caesar, ordered Hyrcanus to discharge Herod, to which he complied. Caesar would be assassinated on March 15, 44 BCE. The conspirators fled Rome, with Cassius fleeing to Syria. Herod had sided with the assassins, allying with Cassius, who appointed Herod as governor of Coel Syria, as well as promising to make him king over all of Judea. Back in Jerusalem, a friend of Hyrcanus II, Malichus, began sowing disunity between Antipater and the high priest, eventually poisoning the procurator. This resulted in Herod hiring assassins to kill Malichus. Multiple rebellions broke out, one in Jerusalem against Phazel, and another led by Aristobulus' son Antigonus, which would be put down by Herod. When Cassius was defeated, the Jewish aristocracy appealed to Mark Antony of the new triumvirate to remove Antipater's sons from power, but they had won his favor. Antony named Herod and Phasel the Tetrarchs of Judea, and Hyrcanus was once again stripped of all political authority. Following his late father's playbook, Herod sought to solidify his family's control over the region by marrying the daughter of Hyrcanus, Mariam, thereby tying his family to the Hasmoneans but they weren't going to hand over control of Judea without a fight. The last surviving son of Aristobulus, Antigonus, had the support of the Jewish aristocracy, who had been opposed to the Hellenist-friendly policies of Antipater. He would seek out support from the Parthians to depose Herod and conquer Jerusalem. When he captured the city, he held both the governor and high priest hostage. He had Hyrcanus II's ears cut off in order to disqualify him from his duties of the high priest, and he would be taken by the Parthians to Babylon. To avoid a similar humiliation himself, Faisal committed suicide. The inhabitants of Galilee rose up against Herod, who would retreat to the fortress of Masada south of the Dead Sea. Antigonus was made king and high priest by the Parthians, and with his army besieged Masada. Herod would leave his brother Joseph in charge of the fortress, while seeking outside help. Herod took a ship to Rome to ask Mark Antony for help. Not only did Antony agree to help Herod militarily, he got the Senate to proclaim Herod the king of Judea. In thanks, he joined Mark Antony and Octavian in making a sacrifice to the temple of Jupiter. In spring of 39 BCE, he landed at Ptolemais and began to reconquer Judea. Antigonus would kill Herod's brother Joseph in battle near Jericho, 
Herod would besiege Jerusalem in the spring of 37 BCE. The fighting inside the city was bloody, but Antigonus would be captured and executed. This was followed by 45 nobles who had supported Antigonus, as well as the Sanhedrin, only sparing the two who tried to convince them to open the gates to Herod during the siege. A new Sanhedrin was convened, which was populated with Sadducees. Neither party had any political authority, and thus their combat was curtailed to debates over theology. The Hasmoneans had merged the offices of king and high priest into a single person, but when presented with the same opportunity, Herod declined. Instead, he appointed an obscure priest from Babylon. One of Hyrcanus' daughters, Alexandra, believed her son, Aristobulus III, the brother of Herod's wife, Mariam, should have been named high priest. Alexandra lobbied Cleopatra, while Mariam lobbied Herod to make her brother the high priest. Antony also reached out to Herod and encouraged him to appoint Aristobulus III, to which he conceded. Aristobulus III was popular, and Herod feared he could challenge him for the throne. He would later imprison Alexandra and Aristobulus in the capital after he discovered a plot for them to flee to Egypt. Herod would have Aristobulus III killed by drowning in a bath in Jericho. Alexandra appealed to Cleopatra, who appealed to Mark Antony, who would summon Herod to answer for the murder. Before he left, he gave instructions that his wife, Mariam, should be put to death if he didn't return. Herod would avoid Antony's rebuke through bribery, but a rumor spread that Herod had been put to death, which caused Alexandra and Mariam to lobby Antony to place Alexandra on the throne. When Herod returned and learned of Alexandra's plot, he had her imprisoned. In 32 BCE, Octavia denounced Mark Antony in the Senate for his monarchical aspirations and oriental pretensions. Herod began arming himself to support Antony, but Cleopatra managed to get him distracted by affairs in Arabia. Cleopatra hoped this fight between the Arabs and Jews would weaken both of them, but it backfired. Not only was he victorious over the Arabs, he managed to avoid making enemies with Octavian by staying out of the fight with Antony and Cleopatra. Herod tried to get Antony to abandon Cleopatra and make up with Octavian, but Antony refused, so Herod switched his allegiance to Octavian. Plutarch credits Herod's abandonment of Antony for the latter's suicide. Herod feared that the remnants of the Hasmoneans might try to rally around the aging Hyrcanus II to try and depose him by allying with Octavian. So Herod accused Hyrcanus II of conspiring with the Arabian king and had him executed. Meanwhile, Mariam was in conflict with Herod's sister, Salome. Salome arranged a failed poisoning of Herod by Mariam's servant, so Mariam would be put on trial and executed. Herod, distraught over the execution of his wife, tried to drown his sorrow in feasting and hunting. He would put Alexandra to death as well after he learns of a plot to further her own interests later. Octavian wins the civil war in 29 BCE and returns to Rome to begin his reorganization of the empire. Judea was at first left alone, due to the Senate having confirmed Herod's kingship. Octavian, now Augustus, had no interest in expanding the empire east of the Euphrates, and Herod was seen as a valuable ally, maintaining order along the imperial frontiers. Herod instituted Hellenist games and Greek plays in honor of the emperor, and he dealt with assassination plots swiftly and severely. Fearing they might be signs of future instability, Herod began constructing numerous fortresses. He also built up a spy network across his domain to report on any seditious activity. He would even disguise himself so he could patrol the streets of Jerusalem personally. Non-sanctioned public activities were forbidden, and torture was used liberally. On top of the fortresses, Herod had other massive building projects. He built entirely new cities and gave them Roman names, as well as temples to the emperor and other Roman gods. He also funded the building of pagan temples outside of his domain. Herod also established new centers of trade, as well as providing some economic stimulus. He wasn't above using the powers of his office for his own personal gain. In fact, he once removed the high priest from office in order to secure a marriage proposal from a family in Alexandria. His biggest construction project was the rebuilding of the Second Temple. He hoped to play into the growing messianism among the Jews. He built on obscure prophecies in the Book of Haggai and the Book of Enoch. He hoped to secure his own popularity amongst Jews by fulfilling prophecy. He made sure to strictly follow the rules of spiritual hygiene at the temple, all the while keeping worship activities going during construction, which wasn't fully completed until 64 CE. Jews were initially grateful for the refurbishing of the temple, but Herod would construct a giant golden eagle over the temple gates, 
which was seen as an idolatrous symbol of Rome and inspired indignation. Before her execution, Herod had two sons with his second wife, Mariam. They were Alexander and Aristobulus, who were educated slash held hostage in Rome. They would return to Judea in 17 BCE. It was believed that they wanted revenge on their aunt Salome for having their mother killed. Herod tried to distract them from this quest by arranging marriages for them. Alexander was married to Glaphyra, the daughter of the king of Cappadocia, and Aristobulus was married to Salome's daughter, Bernice. Salome tried to gin up a fake conspiracy from Alexander and Aristobulus to have her killed in revenge for their mother's death. The allegation was that they reached out to Augustus to reinvestigate their mother's trial. When he learned of this conspiracy, Herod summoned his son from his first wife, named for his father, Antipater. Herod's second wife, Mariam, had orchestrated Antipater's banishment from Jerusalem, and upon his return, Antipater would join forces with Salome. However, Herod would have Alexander and Aristobulus sent back to Rome. Antipater managed to convince his father of Alexander and Aristobulus' conspiracy against Salome and him. When Herod visited Rome and met with Augustus, he accused his sons of conspiracy while Alexander protested. Augustus was able to see through the ruses of the various parties and managed to get Herod and his sons to reconcile. They all returned to Jerusalem, where Herod proclaimed that after his death, Antipater would first rule, followed by Alexander and then Aristobulus. But Antipater had not given up the plot against his half-brothers. Herod's brother Pheroras, along with Salome and Antipater, were allied against Alexander and Aristobulus. They alleged the two were torturing their slaves, which was forbidden by Jewish law, and the slaves corroborated the allegation, and Herod would send Alexander to prison. Many feared another palace massacre, so Archelaus, the king of Cappadocia, intervened in order to save his daughter, who was married to Alexander. Archelaus was able to shift Herod's anger toward his brother Pheroras for the allegations of conspiracy while smoothing over the relations in the family. A neighboring king in Arabia, Obadas II, had a prime minister, Sylleus, who sought the throne for himself. While visiting Jerusalem, he had an affair with Salome, hoping to build an alliance with Judea in his attempt to take the throne in Arabia. Herod approved a marriage between Salome and Sylleia so long as he was circumcised, which Sylleius refused. And so the match was broken off. A rebellion would break out in Trachonitis, which Herod put down. But some of the rebels fled and sought refuge in Arabia, and Sylleius gave them protection, while allowing them to make banditry raids into Judea. Herod demanded that the bandits be handed over, which Sylleius refused, making appeals to Rome. Herod invaded Arabia to capture the bandits. Obidos II would die, and Augustus would have given the Arabian kingdom to Herod, were it not for a letter he received. A man named Eurycles appeared in Herod's court during the drama between Herod's sons. Eurycles tricked all parties into believing he was on their side. He forged letters and legal documents, making it appear that Alexander and Aristobulus were seeking to kill their father. Herod sent them to prison, and Salome tried to get him to kill Alexander and Aristobulus. Herod would send a letter to Augustus asking to adjudicate on the matter. This letter convinced Augustus to not give the Arabian territory to Herod. In disgust, Augustus told Herod to adjudicate the situation with wise advisors. In spite of the advice from the Romans, Herod had his sons strangled to death in prison, and those who had spoken up on their behalf were stoned to death by Herod's orders. With his rivals gone, Antipater had no more legal hurdles challenging his claim to the throne. But the populace blamed him for his brother's deaths. He began to buy the support of his father's friends with lavish gifts, but at this point the alliance between Salome and Antipater broke, and Salome would keep Herod informed of Antipater's machinations against him. However, Salome had gained a reputation of duplicitousness herself, and thus Herod was wary of acting on the intelligence she gave him. One of the truths she did tell Herod was a conspiracy between Ferraris and the Pharisees to dethrone him and make Ferraris king, at which point the eunuch, Bagoas, would find an heir for Ferraris to adopt. This was in line with prophecies in the book of Isaiah and had messianic implications. Herod had the Pharisees who were promoting this messianic prophecy put to death. His son Antipater would be forbidden from contacting his uncle, but they continued conspiring in secret. Antipater would ask Herod to be sent to Rome, which he allowed, sending him with his will, naming Antipater as his successor, and Antipater would use this time in Rome to continue his plotting. 
Ferraris died, and it was revealed that he had been poisoned by Herod's wife, who claimed to have done it on orders from Antipater, who also asked to poison Herod. Antipater's servant, Bathylus, arrived in Jerusalem with letters alleging wrongdoing by his full brothers, Archelaus and Philip, along with another dose of poison for Herod. Herod sent a letter to Antipater asking him to return to Jerusalem. Antipater was unaware of the revelation about his involvement in Ferraris' death. When he arrived in Jerusalem, he saluted Herod, who replied to him, God confound you, you vile wretch. Do not touch me till you have cleared yourself of these crimes that are charged upon you. He was placed on trial and found guilty, at which point he was imprisoned, while Herod waited on word from Augustus on what he should do. He would put Antipater to death. Herod himself was deathly ill, and word began to spread throughout Jerusalem. In response, signs of his heathenous reign were torn down, such as the golden eagle above the gate to the temple, along with other idols. Herod summoned Salome and all his advisors. He had them locked in the Hippodrome, and upon the announcement of his death, he ordered they be massacred, but his posthumous orders would be ignored. In his will, Herod named Archelaus, his son by his wife Malthais, as his successor, and was to reign over Judea, Samaria, and Edomia. Archelaus' brother, Herod Antipas, was named Tetrarch over Galilee and Perea. Another son by his third wife, Cleopatra of Jerusalem, would rule as Tetrarch over Batania, Traconidas, Arontes, Galanatus, Peneus, and Eteria. Salome was given Gemnia, Ashdod, and Phasilis in the Jordan Valley. This will, however, is suspected to have been a forgery, as Herod wouldn't have wanted to split up his domain upon his death, thereby making the realm weaker. It was, most likely, a compromise amongst the numerous factions of Herod's court. Archelaus was like his father and had a golden throne set up in the temple. Demands for tax cuts and punishments for political rivals came in, as well as demands for the deposition of the high priest Josar, as well as the expulsion of the Gentiles from Judea. Archelaus hesitated in meeting any of these demands until his position was reaffirmed by Augustus back in Rome. Passover was coming, and the city of Jerusalem became filled with pilgrims from across Judea. The people were restless. A riot broke out after a confrontation between pilgrims and soldiers. 3,000 people would die in the streets of Jerusalem. A curfew order was put in place, and pilgrims were ordered to return home. Archelaus set off for Rome to lobby for his succession, while matters in Jerusalem were left in the hands of Sabinius, the emperor's administrator for Syrian affairs. By the time Sabinius reached Jerusalem, rebellion had spread across Judea. The governor of Syria, Varus, sent legions from Antioch to help restore order. This only angered the Jews more. Sabinius would use the Roman legion to rob the temple and treasury in Jerusalem, carrying off 400 talents. A Jew named Judas in Galilee led a revolt by seizing the arsenal at Sepphoris. A former slave of King Herod, Simon, proclaimed himself king and looted the royal palace at Jericho. Athrongus, a shepherd and leader of a robber band, also proclaimed himself king. When Varus heard about the growing unrest, he went down personally while gathering more troops along the way. He defeated various rebel groups in battle and had thousands of them crucified. Back in Rome, the various tetrarchs lobbied Augustus, and they asked that Rome appoint a governor to directly control the region. Augustus would mostly impose Herod's last will, with the exception of naming Archelaus ethnarch instead of king, and annexing Gaza, Gadara, and Hippos to the province of Syria. When the new rulers returned home, they were faced with ruin and a population that hated them. Archelaus would have the most tyrannical rule of all of Herod's successors. His rule was so poor and corrupt that in 6 CE, Augustus removed him from office and sent him into exile in Gaul, and had his domains annexed to the province of Syria. Thanks again to Masterworks for sponsoring this video. To learn more about them, check out the top link in the description. I'd also like to thank my newest patrons, Marty, Box, David, and Harrison. In conjunction with sponsors, my patrons help support the YouTube channel financially giving me the resources to make the videos you're watching here. If you get something out of this video and you want to help and have the means to do so, the best way to do that is by joining the Casual Historian Patreon. Members of the Casual Historian Patreon get a number of perks, such as getting to see videos early, getting your names in the end chirons of the video right here, as well as getting access to my scripts, notes, and access to a patrons-only Discord server 
where you can see behind the scenes stuff, as well as just getting to talk to me and other fans directly in a more constructive environment. Now, if all of this is appealing to you and you have the means to do so, then check out patreon.com slash casual historian to learn more. Now, if you liked this video, then you would probably like to see some of my other Jewish history videos, which you can see a playlist for right here. Or you might check out my latest video right here. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.